Our fir first witness is Ms. Cheryl Atkinson. Ms. Atkinson is an investigative journalist and the host of the national uh, television news program, Full Measure. For 30 years, Ms. Atkinson was a correspondent and anchor at CBS News, PBS, CNN, and in local news. CBS News has confirmed that someone has been breaking into the computer of our investigative correspondent, Cheryl Atkinson. Security experts are still trying to identify who did that. Cheryl Atkinson is in Washington this morning and joins us now. Cheryl, what was happening with your computer that made you suspicious? Well, Gail, there were signs of unusual happenings in my home for many months, and that included odd behavior of both my work and my personal computers. One example was the computers began turning themselves on and then back off again during the night. I was able to verify and obtain some information on the suspicious activities, and I reported that to CBS News Management in January, since it included CBS equipment and systems. CBS then hired an independent cybersecurity firm, which conducted a thorough forensic analysis, and that ruled out the ordinary malware phishing programs and that sort of thing. So Cheryl, you have been reporting on Benghazi. You did some of the groundbreaking work on the Fast and Furious program. What exactly did the intruder do or what were they looking for, do we know, on your computer? Well, with the investigation continuing, we can't give all the details, but the analysis found very unusual activity buried deep in the computer. The unauthorized party accessed the CBS computer in my home on multiple occasions, and specifically in December, they used sophisticated methods to cover their tracks, meaning they tried to remove the indications of their previous unauthorized activity. And we're not prepared to talk more about the who is and who did this today, but the intruder is considered highly skilled and used very sophisticated methods. Uh, this would be a fear for all of us, but tell us your own reaction to know to knowing that this kind of invasion has taken place. Well, when any unauthorized party comes into the home of an American, whether it's a private citizen or a journalist, and searches through their computers, inserting or removing material for whatever their reason is, it's a very serious and disturbing matter. I'm outraged that anyone would do such a thing, and CBS News takes all of this very seriously. Uh, computer experts saying this looks like this is someone who has a stuck space key or a stuck key. I mean, I guess my question about this video is this is a really big claim. It's not a claim that's implausible on its face. The government would hack into a, a, a reporter's uh, computer. That, that seems I could be persuaded of that claim. But that's a really big claim, particularly the idea that live as you are watching, someone is remotely, con presumably knowing that you've loaded this file, remotely deleting your text in front of you. What is the evidence that that is happening? You mean um, besides it, me observing it happening? Well, you mean the computers do crazy things all the time, and I don't think we, yeah. we make the judgment. Like, my computer will do nutty things, or I went through periods where my laptop was clicking on stuff I wasn't clicking on, but I didn't think, right. well, there's the NSA. <laughs> right. <laughs> and certainly I didn't when things were happening the year before. I never dreamed, you know, I was being surveilled by anybody. It was only after sources and then the computer forensics exam. So with that, I guess, context, the months of time that passed after that under which I was getting more and more forensic evidence about what they'd been doing and what they were capable of, one of the things the forensics evidence showed was, although they were monitoring me surreptitiously, they had the ability to operate my computers remotely as if they were sitting in front of it. So I knew that the capability existed. I wouldn't have known that so a year before. Who, who, I'm sorry. Let me, let me just ask this question. Who is, who is the they? In which, in which sentence, I'm sorry. Like the they were able to surveil, they were monitoring the computer, they had the capability. Who is the they? Who who is it, whoever, whoever it would be that was responsible. But who is that? Well, therein lies the question. I think that that's a large part of what the computer forensics investigation is aiming toward and what we're trying to look at. But don't, you, you write in the book that you had a source who told you who it was, right? Yes, yes. So then you should, then you know. I think I know who was responsible in the macro sense for being behind the effort, not necessarily the guy sitting behind a keyboard if such a thing exists, but yes, but I'm not going to throw out the name because that was based on a human source that I trust, but it's not something I'm comfortable with with naming and releasing. So there's there's one source who told you uh, unnamed who was the who was doing this to your computer or who was engineering what you say is a surveillance of the computer. That's right. 
And now when you talk about these, but you don't want to name that person or you don't want to confront those people publicly because you don't want to expose that source or you're not confident in it? I just have reasons. I'm following advice of my attorney. This is very much ongoing, and I'm just not comfortable with using the name right now. I don't think it's a good idea. James Comey said in his September 30th testimony before Judiciary uh, that he was proud of the work done by Crossfire Hurricane. That was the investigation on President Trump, at that time Canada Trump. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I've been a nonpartisan journalist for nearly 40 years in local news, CNN, CBS, PBS, and the national station group Sinclair. I've witnessed a dramatic devolution in my industry as we've allowed ourselves to be transformed into tools of political and corporate interests, pushing narratives, slanting information on the news and online, and seeking to shape public opinion rather than report facts and various views. This means today's media landscape has allowed some of the biggest and most important stories of our time to be covered in a fantastical and one-sided, often inaccurate and incomplete way, or perhaps escape coverage entirely, while important violations of law and constitutional rights by powerful interests go unchallenged. We have to confront the fact that our intelligence structure and some inside our federal agencies have proven more powerful than Congress, the legislative or judicial branches, more influential with the media and largely immune from oversight and after the most egregious violations from prosecution. Even the president of the United States, whoever it may be, plays second fiddle to this structure. And partly because the news media has dropped the ball, these players are unaccountable, operating in an extra constitutional fashion that persists from administration to administration, meaning this is not a partisan issue. Just one example can be found in the government spying on journalists and other innocent Americans. After an incredible series of revelations beginning in 2013, nobody was held accountable. Government agents initiated secret surveillance and subpoenas against then Fox News reporter James Rosen and Associated Press reporters. CBS, where I worked at the time, publicly announced in 2013 that forensics proved my computers were remotely hacked and my work remotely monitored and the CBS news systems were accessed in the spy effort as well. After the forensics definitively proved the government was responsible, had secretly installed a keystroke monitoring program, exfiltrated files, listened in on me secretly activating audio, looked through my work photos, then remotely overwrote computer logs to try to erase their tracks when we discovered them, nothing happened, zero. To this day, I'm still suing in civil court, trying to force the Justice Department to reveal the names of all the specific agents involved and, so I thought at one point, force accountability and stop it from happening to others. But seven long years later, it's an uphill battle as the Justice Department defends the guilty agents using taxpayer dollars. It should be no surprise that intel abuse has continued. When top intel officials at the time, James Clapper and John Brennan, provided false information to Congress about surveillance of American citizens and the CIA spying on Senate computers, all is forgiven. When the Inspector General refers former FBI Director James Comey for criminal charges, the Justice Department says no need, he meant no harm. When FBI Director Christopher Wray falsely testifies to Congress that there have been no 702 surveillance abuses, contrary to numerous findings by the FISA court and others, nobody says a word. When government officials unmask the names of innocent American citizens, when Congress makes dozens of referrals for criminal charges regarding alleged intel misbehavior, when committees request relevant documents from federal agencies they're supposed to oversee, when FBI cell phones containing possible evidence of corruption are repeatedly accidentally wiped, when information is illegally leaked for political purposes, nothing. The people responsible for these things, were to believe, were confused didn't understand the question, didn't understand the rules, didn't mean any harm. It was an accident. But those not on their team are never afforded the same generous benefit of the doubt. This has caused a crisis of confidence in our public institutions. Among many, there's a lack of trust in Congress, the media, health officials, the Justice Department, and our elections process. Now, even when Congress may be doing the public good, the media may be telling the truth, Health officials may be giving good advice, the Department of Justice may be doing the right thing, or the elections aren't fraudulent. Many don't buy the story we're telling. We've created this environment over a period of decades. And then we look at the public, which watches the double standards whipsawed between the alternate realities presented by the media, 
And we ask why they're mistrustful as if it's their doing when it's ours. And if we're unable to change things, we can only expect more of the same or worse. Thank you. It's a case by case thing. There is no standard across our profession. In fact, one of the things I've criticized is that at the beginning of the Trump administration, many news organizations announced that they were suspending their normal ethics and standards that dictate how their news organization typically deals with things such as use of anonymous sources, that they were suspending these because they said they needed to suspend their standards to cover a uniquely dangerous president. And I've argued, and I think you've observed, that I actually think there's no more important time for us to keep our standards and ethics than when we're covering somebody that maybe we don't like or we have strong feelings about. That's what standards are for. And instead, we saw this lifting starting in the 2016 time period and this changing of everything, you know, the way we used to cover things. And at CBS News, there were very strict rules we went by to use anonymous sources as a last resort and only with very certain and specific uh, caveats and disclosures. All that has changed. And even, you know, the news organizations, people used to consider the top ones um, in the country, and if not the world. And there is no overarching body that dictates how this stuff has to be handled. Well, at a minimum, one would think there would be an apology and the people who took part in these actions would no longer be in a position that they could ever work in the government again and do these types of things. But people see that nothing happened to them. You know, why should, why should anybody change the way they operate? In my case, this was illegal actions. So obviously they should be prosecuted. But who's the prosecutorial authority? the Department of Justice and FBI, who are the ones implicated. And since they're not going to do the job, you have somebody like me, just a citizen, trying to bring a case in court to force what the Department of Justice is supposed to do criminally. I have, have not done as deep a dive into the Hunter Biden question as other journalists who have written really good pieces, including left-leaning publications starting uh, about a year ago this time. We're doing some great investigations, and I think that can be attributed to the fact that at the time, there must have been people putting out the narrative, as I say in the news, that did not want Joe Biden to be um, the nominee or wanted somebody else. So therefore, even among left-leaning political figures and so on, this was debated. But then once Joe Biden became the nominee, it evaporated, at least as a discussion among the liberal press and left-leaning figures, and it became supposedly a conspiracy theory by conservatives at that point, although it was quite well documented and covered previously. I learned that there are, um, at the very least, some very legitimate questions to ask about conflict of interest <laughs> and potential conflict of interest. I learned that if you substituted the name Biden and Trump or Trump's children and Biden's children, I think you would undoubtedly have a very different kind of media coverage. How can they continue then to, to not care about something like Hunter Biden? Well, I worked at CNN back when it was a news organization back in 1990-93, and we wouldn't have dreamed of covering stories. I spoke to many former CNN insiders in the book that I just wrote. They're all horrified at the turn that this once very prestigious and fairly straight down the middle news organization has taken. And you have to understand if if you realize that the media landscape has now been successfully co-opted and we've invited them in, I say we've been infiltrated by these interests that want to turn us into these mouthpieces, then you understand that when you do that job, you put forth a narrative, even if it proves not to be true, that you are given promotions and attention and your views are then amplified by the like-minded media and social media. And it feels like you're doing everything right. Your colleagues are patting you on the back. And it just sort of feeds upon itself. But it's evolved into a situation where it's not journalism as certainly as I knew it. And as I think many Americans, if you've been around long enough, thought, thought of journalism, I think it's all being redefined right now and changed. So I'm not an expert on this, but a lot of people think that it is not going to be able to go back to what it once was, even though there is a demand. Even people who want to get their left-leaning news from CNN and maybe their right-leaning news from Fox or somewhere else, they still want a place they can go that they feel is just telling you the story where it leads and more down the middle. But um, the people I spoke to, to the extent these are news executives who worked in the industry, they don't feel, if they had to guess, that CNN can go back to what it was, but they also don't think it survives moving forward without Donald Trump the villain in the way that it's been doing the last four years.